in the fourth week of our six-week series of messages on Simon Peter, a flawed yet faithful disciple. And as clearly as Peter's faults are showcased in the gospel, so are the stories of his courage, his determination, and his longing to follow Jesus, even when it ultimately cost him his life. Simon Peter became the rock upon which the church was built. And so today, I want to focus on Simon Peter on the night in which Jesus Christ was betrayed. This was an evening that included Jesus in a radical reversal of expectations. He washed the dirty feet of his disciples. It was a night when a typical Passover feast was altered by Jesus, who proclaimed that the bread was now meant to symbolize his body. And the wine was to indicate the spilling of his blood. It was a night when Jesus foretold all to his disciples that they would abandon him. And I want to focus on Simon Peter on the night in which Jesus Christ was betrayed. I want to pick up in Matthew chapter 26, uh, verse 31. Hear now the word of the Lord. Then Peter said to them, You will all become deserters. Because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go ahead of you unto Galilee. And Peter said to him, though all will become deserters because of you, I will never desert you. And Jesus said to him, Truly, I tell you this very night, before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. And Peter said to him, even though I must die with you, I will not deny you. And so said all of the disciples. Now, friends, after dinner, Jesus and the disciples went to the garden to, uh, on the hillside of what is called the Mount of Olives. It's called Gethsemane. Gethsemane means a place of crushing. And around midnight, armed guards came to arrest Jesus. And Peter drew a sword and he cut off the ear of one of the people in the mob as Jesus was being led through the dark to face a trial before the Sanhedrin, Peter then followed from a distance. He was obscured by the darkness of the night until he came to the courtyard of the high priest, which is about a mile from the garden where Jesus was arrested. And while Jesus was facing interrogation by the religious people inside the house of Caiaphas, Peter was facing scrutiny by the mob outside as the fires of the courtyard began to illuminate faces. I then want to pick up a little later in uh, uh, Matthew chapter 26 when it says this. Now, Peter was sitting outside the courtyard. A servant girl came to him and said, You also were with Jesus the Galilean. But he denied it before all of them, saying, I do not know what you are talking about. Then he went out to the porch. Another servant girl saw him, and she said to the bystanders, The man was with Jesus of Nazareth. Again, he denied it uh, with an oath. I do not yet know the man. And after a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, Certainly, you are one of them, for your accent betrays you. Then he began to curse, and he swore an oath. I do not know the man. And at that moment, the cock crowed. Then Peter remembered what Jesus had said. Before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out. And he wept bitterly. Let's pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth, may the meditations of each of our hearts, pray that they'll be found loving and acceptable in your sight. Lord, you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. We like leaders who are confident, don't we? I mean, for instance, when an athletic director chooses a coach for our teams, we want that coach to exude confidence that they can lead your team to the state title. In the midst of a crisis, we want our elected officials to be calm in a storm. 
Now, I've been reading a remarkable book on Winston Churchill in the early 1940s called The Splendid and the Vile. When Britain was being battered by Hitler's bombs and their ships were being sunk by the U-boats. Yet Churchill offered the British people confidence that if they resisted the tyranny, they would ultimately prevail. In the midst of the challenges of life, we desire a confidence that understands that we can weather the storm and that giving up is not an option. And while we appreciate people in leadership who demonstrate a confidence, we know there is a big difference between a confidence and a cockiness, isn't there? Uh, According to the dictionary uh, definition, cockiness is marked by overconfidence or arrogance. Whereas we appreciate confidence, we loathe those who are so cocky that they feel that they are better and smarter than everyone else. All of us, we can identify people in our lives, can't we? Co-workers, maybe relatives, neighbors, uh, perhaps if we were even honest, ourselves. We fight the temptation between an inner confidence and an arrogant cockiness. So what's the difference then between confidence and cockiness? Well, I think here are a few of the differences. Confidence is focused outwardly. In other words, what can I do to help others? While cockiness is focused inwardly. What can I do to promote myself? Confidence is being honest and upfront with people regardless of the consequences, while cockiness means that you will hide uh, bad news so that you will not look bad. But perhaps the biggest difference between confidence and cockiness is realizing the basis of our confidence. If you think that all of your good fortune, all of your intelligence, all of your wisdom comes from within yourself, then you'll find that kind of false pride that will be very shaky indeed. If instead you base your confidence in God, a God who desires us to use our gifts, our intelligence, and our leadership to make a difference in our larger world, then you'll find a source of quiet confidence. (laughs) Perhaps the poster child for cockiness is the one who heard the cock crow on the night of Jesus' betrayal. Earlier that evening, Simon Peter had rejected uh, Jesus' prediction that all the disciples would reject him. Notice Peter's word choice. I will never desert you, verse 33. Or or even though I must die with you, I will not deny you, verse 35. Uh, Simon Peter was a natural leader, and Jesus had uh, told him that he would be called the rock, which is Peter, on which the church of Jesus Christ would find an anchor. Simon Peter believes that he has an inner resolve to be able to withstand any temptation. Yet the lesson that Peter discovers this night is that if he has to depend upon his own strength, then the church is built on one very slippery rock, isn't it? And as the night unfolds, Jesus' prediction was exact. In the midst of the trials that he faced, Simon Peter's fears and his flaws surface. Now, There are all kinds of trials that take place in our day, isn't there? I mean, in courtrooms, for instance, juries are convened. Judges preside to hear the various sides of arguments and conflicts. Some trials, frankly, are pretty simple. Traffic court, where you 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 pay your fines after an accident. Others are much more emotional, maybe like divorce trials, where custody is decided. They're criminal trials. They are filled with drama worthy of an evening news. But besides all these kind of public trials, there are many other trials that take place far from the public's eye. This kind of trial is when our convictions and our beliefs are put to test. This kind of trial often happens in the middle of the night as we stare upwards at a ceiling or when we sit in an emergency room in a hospital uh, or we have a family meeting to make a decision that will affect everyone's life. These are the kind of trials that shape our lives. 
trials like when your child is addicted to drugs and begs you to give them just a little more money or when your spouse comes home and tells you they want out of a marriage or when you're trying to agree with your siblings about the care of a parent in the words of thomas Paine, these are the kind of times that try man's soul and in the middle of the night on which Jesus Christ was betrayed, uh, both kinds of trial are taking place. The first one involved the trial of Jesus before the high priest and the Jewish ruling council called the Sanhedrin. The other kind of trial, the kind that takes place far from the public eye, but shapes a person's life, is taking place with Peter in the courtyard of the high priest around a fire. Well, let's start with the trial of Jesus before the ruling council for the Jewish nation, called the Sanhedrin. This court consisted of 71 religious leaders who were entrusted with making decisions for the Jewish people, as long as it didn't interfere with Roman authority. In other words, the Romans cared for the big things, but left most of the minor details with the local authorities. In most matters of dispute, the Sanhedrin would hear testimony, they'd ask questions, they'd issue judgment that were binding to the people. Now, in the case of Jesus, this ruling council was summoned out of bed in the middle of the night during a high holy day. Their leaders were so upset because earlier that week, Jesus had entered the temple area and had overturned the money changers, which, of course, threatened their economic livelihood. Earlier that week, Jesus had taught in the temple and had accused the leaders of being whitewashed tombs. Earlier that week, the rulers had tried to trap Jesus in an argument, but Jesus had always turned the table on them. But perhaps the thing that was most upsetting was that Jesus had predicted the destruction of the temple and had even said that when the temple was destroyed, it it would be restored within three days. (laughs) Now imagine, if you're part of Congress and someone who was very popular with the people predicted that the Statue of Liberty, the White House, the Capitol, all would be destroyed. We would begin to believe that person was a terrorist or that they stood again against everything that we believed in. That was the mood and the night that Jesus was tried. As Jesus stood on trial before the entire Sanhedrin, those who were prosecuting the case discovered that their witness hadn't been prepped and they couldn't agree. And while they made conflicting claims, Jesus just stood silent. Finally, the high priest grew tired of Jesus' silence to all the accusation, and he looked at him and he asked him point blank the question that was central to the whole trial. Did he believe that he was the Messiah, the Son of God? This was the moment of truth. Caiaphas wanted to know the truth. Was Jesus the one that had been promised? And when asked, point blank, if he was the Messiah, the Son of God, Jesus simply said, I am. The Sanhedrin had their proof for conviction. Meanwhile, there was a second trial taking place in the courtyard. This one much more personal and private, and it involved Simon Peter. He had promised hours earlier to never leave Jesus' side, but in the events of the evening, all of his friends had decided to go socially distant after all. (laughs) Under the cover of darkness, Peter managed to make it as close as the courtyard where many people were milling about. And despite the fear of being detected, Simon saw the fire where others were gathered around to get warm from a Palestinian early spring night. And as he drew near to get more comfortable, he was spotted by some woman in the crowd. You were with Jesus the Galilean. Simon backed away from the light and denied it. But it happened again, and now many eyes were upon him. He must have felt cornered like every set of eyes were directed at him. A third time he was asked if he was with Jesus and then he utters a curse and an oath. Now when we hear the terms today, curse and oath, 
We might think that Simon just used some bad words. But in that culture, a curse was something that you, you did that invited destruction on yourself if it wasn't true. To both curse and to swear was something reserved only for the most serious of accusation. By now, the dawn is beginning to occur. Off in the distance, a rooster begins his morning crow. And as Peter heard the rooster, it reminded him of Jesus' prediction that before the cock would crow uh, three times, Peter would deny Jesus. That sound of the bird was enough. He felt convicted. And this big, blurry, burly fisherman went weeping out into the night. He felt so ashamed that he had let Jesus down. Friends, I think there's a big difference between guilt and shame. All of us have had moments when we have felt guilt, like when we fail to act on a promise and we need to make it right, or when we yell at someone in a fit of anger and now we feel guilty for snapping at them. Or maybe when we haven't prayed or read our Bible, we feel guilty that we've neglected God. Guilt is a reminder that we need to be true to our conviction. Guilt really is a gift to keep us centered on God. However, shame is when you begin to believe that you are a bad person without redemptive possibilities. And here is a lesson that all of us need to hear. Yes, we should feel guilt when we sin. Yes, we should feel a pang of conscience when we hurt someone with our words or action. Yes, we should feel a knot in our stomachs when we don't stand up to someone who makes a racist remark or gossips about another. God gives us guilt as a gift to bring us back. In fact, I really worry when people don't have guilt. But shame is another thing. When we feel shame, we don't think we can be restored. We are so ashamed that we don't go to church. We are so ashamed that we avoid other people. We are so ashamed that we begin to believe the lie that we are beyond God's great redemption. I think the story of Simon Peter reminds us that although we can't measure up to God's terms, God will restore us by his terms. I have to believe that when Peter heard the cock crow, it did two things for him. It convicted him of his guilt of turning away from Jesus, but at the same time, the cock crowing was also a reminder of hope. For as Jesus had predicted the night before, when the cock crow, Peter would deny him three times, but Jesus had also said to Peter that he would go ahead of him to Galilee. Friends, for even when we stray from the Lord, there is a promise that the Lord is always ahead of us, even when we deny him. Which I think really brings us to the good news of this message that I want to offer to all of us. All of us have had moments when we have denied our Lord. Maybe there have been times when we have been mad at God, or we've been so caught up in an addiction or a sin that we've avoided God like the plague. But God's love always goes before us and calls us back. For when we come to Christ, we are forgiven. And we're enabled to go forth with a clean slate to witness uh, the remarkable power of Jesus to restore us. And like Simon Peter, we don't need to be defined by a failure. Jesus is the Lord of a second chance. And we too can use our failures to illuminate the path for others. Let's pray. Almighty and gracious God, Lord, even in those moments when we feel guilt, I pray that we can sense that you always go before us to offer us redemption, to offer us a chance to be reconciled with you. Lord, we need your strength this day. It's in our Savior's name and for his sake we pray. Amen.